All right, let's get to it. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to sail fishing and kite fishing. You know, first let's talk a little bit about the fish. Who here has caught a sailfish? Okay, a lot of hands going up. Absolutely awesome. I can tell you I lost count as to how many sailfish I caught a long time ago, but yet every single one that I continue to catch is just as exciting. They really are. These fish fight like crazy. They're aggressive. They jump like crazy. You know, just an absolutely awesome predator. And right now, these pelagic fish, they're on their migratory path, and they're coming down the beach as we speak. They're still, the big body of fish is still a little bit further north, Fort Pierce, Palm Beach, but there's a lot of fish in this area right here, and the bite's on fire, especially with this cold front, and it's going to continue should only get better from here on out. Keep in mind though, winter time, while it's peak sailfish season, you can catch these fish year round. Middle of the summer, July, go out there, you can kite fish and catch a sailfish. It's gonna happen you know, year round. But again, this is peak season from now through March into April is really peak sailfish season. Anybody can go out there and catch one of these things. But to do it consistently, to do it on a professional level, requires a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of work, okay, and a lot of preparation. But if you do it all right, you know, your success ratio is going to go up substantially and you're going to have a great time on the water. Keep in mind, we're going to talk about some basic stuff, but we're going to talk a lot about some upper level kind of stuff. You know, anybody here fish sailfish tournaments? these high-end sailfish tournaments, we have one hand out of this entire crowd, just one guy raised his hand. And let me tell you why. These sailfish tournaments are very, very competitive. They're also very expensive. It is not uncommon for a team to invest fifty to $75,000 to fish one tournament. But there's hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line. So trust me when I tell you, when they go out there with that much money at stake, they're, on, they're sharp. Okay, they have double, triple, quadruple checked everything. And they are really, really sharp because they know every single fish matters. As a matter of fact, it was just a tournament up in uh, Palm Beach, the uh, Operation Sailfish. The top boat won by one fish. One fish, okay? So it makes every single bite makes a big, big difference. So like I said, we're going to talk about really everything from beginning to end. I'm going to try and cover as much as I can, but certainly, you know, it's impossible to talk about everything in an hour, in 60 to 90 minutes. Regarding questions, at the end of the seminar, I'm going to be up here for as long as it takes to answer all of your questions. We're also going to raffle off one of my kites, okay? Um, so if you do have any questions, just please hold them to the end of the seminar. So lots of ways to catch sailfish. You can troll for these fish, okay? A lot of guys troll with rig ballyhoo and dredges. You can simply drift for these fish, you know, with flat lines, but nothing is more effective and nothing is more exciting than kite fishing. And that's what this is about. Kite fishing is a science, okay? It's, it's really a science and it takes a lot of experience and a lot of practice to really get dialed in. And every single day on the water is different. You can go kite fishing today and you can go kite fishing tomorrow and the conditions may be 180 degrees off. In other words, completely different. And you don't know what you're gonna find, you know, because we all know that the NOAA forecasts, how accurate are those guys? Okay. <laughs> Not so much, right? It's the only job you can get paid to lie, you know, or make mistakes every day. Nevertheless, you know, conditions change. They change a lot, so you really have to be ready across the board. So for starters, we're going to kind of do a virtual kite fishing trip for sailfish. We're leaving tomorrow morning at the crack of dawn. We want to get out there as early as possible because we want to maximize our time on the water and the early bird gets the worm. Prior to even leaving the dock, what's the first thing that we need to have on our boat? Bait. Bait, okay? Let's talk about bait. Pilchards, goggle eyes, blue runners, speedos, there's a lot of different live baits that are effective for sailfish, but nothing beats the goggle eye. Day in and day out, nothing beats the goggle eye, okay? You can purchase goggle eyes, 80 to $100 a dozen. Okay, and while you may say to yourself, 80 to $100 a dozen, what a ripoff. In reality, it's not that much of a ripoff because you've got 12 baits, you're guaranteed 12 bites. Goggle eyes don't die. 
Okay, the only time they die is when they get eaten, as long as you treat them well. So you can purchase the bait, or of course you can go out and catch your own bait. And fishing for goggle eyes and catching goggle eyes is its own seminar. Okay, but one way or the other, you need to leave the dock with plenty of bait. How much bait? Well, let me give you an example. These tournament teams never fish the same bait twice. So after that bait, when they deploy that bait, when they bring that, back, that bait back in, they'll never fish that bait again. Okay, they'll always put a fresh bait on. It is not uncommon to go out for a full day of sail fishing with at least 10 dozen goggle eyes. So you do the math, $800 in bait, you know, if you're going to purchase it, starts to make, you know, fishing for goggle eyes seem a little bit more feasible. But one way or the other, you certainly need to have a load of bait. You know, even a dozen, even you can go out there with a dozen goggle eyes, okay? And it also depends as to how many kites you're fishing. A lot of guys that are just getting into kite fishing, who's kite fished before? Okay, uh, obviously quite a few. You can go out and fish with one kite and fish one bait off of one kite, and then 12 baits is gonna last you a long time. However, if you go out and fish two kites with three baits off of each kite, that's a half a dozen fresh gogs every time you stop that boat. And, it's, and when that bites on, and let me tell you, if there's some dolphin in the area, or some kingfish in the area, or a bonita in the area, it's easy to go through a lot of bait. So the more bait you can get, the better. Like I said, pilchards will work. Live ballyhoo is another excellent option that you can easily catch right out here on the reef. And you can dangle ballyhoo from kites as well. But day in and day out, the goggle eye is the best bait. Why is that bait so good for sailfish? It's because it's so hardy. It's such a lively bait. It's full of vibrance. And when it sees that sailfish coming, when this guy comes up on that kite bait, and he comes up on that goggle eye that's freaking out, that goggle eye is going to react. Okay, he's going to react. He's going to try and dart away and get away from that goggle eye. And that's what's going to turn that sailfish from a looker into an eater. Okay, that fish, that bait has to react because that sailfish knows it's a good, healthy, lively bait. If your goggle eye just lays over on its side and doesn't move when that fish comes up to take a peek, what's going to happen? Okay, he may not eat it at all. He may just swim around it and not eat it. You know, we've seen this a thousand times. You go out there, you'll kite fish, you're looking out, and you're looking at your bait, and you see what appears to look like a black garbage bag, okay, swimming around under the bait. You, you know, so many people say, oh, look, there's that black garbage bag. I'm like, that's not a black garbage bag. That's a sailfish, okay? So don't look for that. Look for a black garbage bag circling your bait. And that's really what they look like. But again, if that bait isn't vibrant and lively, they often turn off and just swim away unless they're really on the feed and the bite is hot, which it's been lately, okay? So bait, make sure you've got plenty of bait. Next, your tackle, okay? And again, remember, we're going on this virtual trip. We're walking through the entire process as to what you need before you even leave the inlet. Your tackle, your rods and reels. When we are kite fishing, we're fishing a Chaos KC 15 to 30. It's a seven foot rod rated for 15 to 30 pound line. It's light, very comfortable to fish, has a soft tip, okay, but it's a very strong rod. It's matched to a Daiwa Saltist, I'm sorry, a Daiwa Saltiga 50H. Okay, it's a lever drag reel, a single speed reel, does not need to be a two speed reel for kite fishing. Holds a lot of line, 20 pound diamond line, high vis line. There's 500 plus yards of line on here. Keep in mind, if you are drifting and you're fishing multiple baits and you hook up on one fish and that fish decides to go south and you hook up on another fish on a double and that fish decides to go north and you're completely stretched out, you need to have plenty of line capacity. So make sure you've got a reel with plenty of line capacity. Nice smooth drag, there's a lot of options out there for reels, doesn't have to be, you know, a fancy schmancy lever drag reel, 600 bucks, whatever. You can fish a $200 reel, okay, a star drag reel. Just make sure that it's got a good smooth drag and fresh line. I cannot stress this enough, fresh line, okay. Do not go out, you know, looking for these sailfish and you feel your line and it's all abraded and old and the line's funky colors and you've had it on the reel for seven years and you think you're a hot shot and you're gonna go out sail fishing, you're gonna get busted off every time. Okay, your tackle is super important when it comes to targeting these fish. Fresh line, high vis, again, 
very important, makes it very easy to see your lines going up to the kite and down to the water. Okay, and sometimes that can be challenging when you're looking right into the sun, depending on, of course, what the breeze is doing. So stick with the high vis line if you're going to set up some rods dedicated exclusively for kite fishing. Okay, stay away from the spinning outfits when you're kite fishing. It's all about conventional rods. Another thing that's very important about this, this reel, this outfit, and certainly the reel, is it's very fast. It's a hyperspeed reel. So when that fish comes along, grabs my gog, and the line pops out of the clip, I can reel up all of that slack very, very fast as that line comes falling off the kite. Okay, and especially if it's the long bait, you've got a big bow of line, a lot of slack out there. With a reel, the power, okay, you know, with a reel that's at least 6.4 or 7 to 1, okay, you can reel up a lot of that slack very, very fast. So a high speed reel is really important. How many rods do we fish? We bring 12. Okay, we fish two kites, three baits off of each kite, and we each have another three rods rigged and ready to go. Because when the bite's hot, that's no time to be re-rigging. You want to be able to just grab another rod. Certainly you don't need 12. Obviously you can go out with whatever you have. But again, these pro competitive teams, the guys are at the top of the game, are not going out there with two rods. They're going out with an entire arsenal because they know how important it is to be able to maximize on every bite. Sailfish are not generally, I don't want to say they're a schooling fish, but certainly they swim in hunting packs and oftentimes where there is one, there is more. Okay, and you want to be able to maximize on multiple bites and often turn one bite into two, sometimes three. Sometimes you get completely covered up, a whole pot of fish will move down and just attack every kite bait that you have. So again, make sure that your tackle is ready to go and that you have as much backup as you possibly can. Our kite rods, really, really simple, just a little chaos kite rod matched to a Daiwa Tanacom 750. Okay, it's a power assist kite rod, obviously a little cord comes off the back of this reel, plugs in under the gunnel, and this is a power reel. You know, back in the day we used to kite fish with the manual crank 4.0s and 6.0s, that's what we used as kite reels. We don't use those any longer. What's really nice about this, it's like having another person on the boat because you've got a preset as to where you can stop that kite. You have variable speed on the reel. So when you want to retrieve that kite, you can pop that into whatever speed you would like if you want to bring it in fast or if you want to bring it in slow. And it'll stop at a certain point. And if you have a helium balloon on your kite, obviously your kite will just be suspended right off the water, 20 feet away from the boat, waiting for you to retrieve it. Okay, obviously with no balloon, on the kite, what's going to happen to the kite? Okay, it's going to fall in the water. And by the way, has anybody ever lost a kite in the water? If you've ever been kite fishing, have you ever dunked a kite? Whoever's not raising their hand is not telling the truth. Okay, we've all dunked kites, and there's nothing worse than dunking a kite. I see you guys, I see your eyes, I know you have. Okay, once that kite falls in the water, man, that's like the worst thing that can happen. So, nevertheless, you know, another thing that's really important about these kite reels, this one is loaded with 50 pound braid. The top teams will have multiple kite rods, okay, multiple kite rods and reels loaded with different braid. As light as 30 pound when there's no wind whatsoever and as heavy as 80 pound when it's blowing 30 to 40 and they're out there fishing a tournament. You cannot take a reel that's loaded with 30, 30 pound braid, okay, and fly a heavy wind kite when it's blowing a gale. You'll potentially break that line and there goes your kite and that's a whole other nightmare. So they have different kite rods designed for different conditions. If you only have one and you had to fill it with something, I would fill it with 50 pound diamond braid. That's a good average that'll work for most of the scenarios. If you have the ability to have multiple kite rods, you know, different sets for different conditions, go with 30 pound for the light wind days. You can go all the way up to 80 pound on the really, really heavy wind days. 
Rods we talked about, our kite rods we talked about, let's talk a little bit about kites. Remember what I just said, the conditions change. Every day is different. Right now there's barely any wind at all. Tomorrow I think it's not going to be, you know, variable winds. Nothing at all. So they make different kites designed for different wind conditions. Just as an example, this is a high wind kite. You will notice that it has holes in it to allow some of that breeze to fly through it. It's a high velocity kite from Tigris. Tigris is a good brand. SFE is a good brand. Bob Lewis, there's a variety of manufacturers out there. You know, just make sure that you invest in the best kite that you possibly can or the best set of kites. My kite bag right here, I don't know about your kite bag, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 kites, okay? And that's nothing compared to what some of these tournament teams have because, again, the conditions change. And once this kite gets wet, it's not going to fly right. It's just not going to fly right when it gets wet until it dries, so you need to have backups. Plus, bars break, lines break, different things happen, so make sure that you have spares. Again, a high wind kite versus a low wind kite. Okay, this is when there's no wind at all. You can see the size of the kite is what? Substantially larger. Why? to catch more air, to catch more wind, okay? When it's really windy, I don't need a big sail. I don't need a big kite like this. I can get away with a small kite like this, okay? So keep that in mind, that obviously the size of the kite is gonna make a difference depending on the conditions out there, okay? Then there's your regular average wind kite, you know, that'll fly in most conditions. Again, this is a Tigris. SFE, you've all seen them, red kites, green kites, both of those, by the way, are the same. They're just different colors, okay? So you have a kite that does fly in most conditions. If you're going to invest in only one kite, this would be the one that you invest in. These are specialty kites for specialty scenarios. You can fly this in high wind, but not super high wind because you'll potentially break it. You can fly this in low wind scenarios and also attach a balloon to this kite. So again, an average wind kite, something 10 to 20 knots, you know, your average kite. If you're only going to buy one, that would be the one to buy. However, make sure, you know, kites are very finicky. They're like women. They're very finicky. Okay, you cannot just unwrap it, take it out there, and expect it to fly perfectly. It's not going to. You've got to treat it very, very carefully, very nice. Make sure that when you rig it, these little spars, these carbon fiber and graphite spars, make sure they're pushed all the way in there. Check all of your swivels, all of your knots. If anything is off and anything is wrong, if this is twisted, okay, twisted back on itself, your kite potentially may not fly right. Plus, keep in mind, if you break one of these spars, it's very challenging to replace this spar. They do give you a spare. When you purchase kites, they'll give you, especially Tigris, they'll give you a spare spar, okay? But do not try and take one from a different manufacturer and mix and match, because it just isn't gonna fly right. The only way, you know, what I've found if I break a spar on a kite, the only way that that kite will ever really fly flawlessly again is when there's a balloon on it. Otherwise, they tend to give you a lot of trouble. Point is, treat the kite really well. Okay, rinse it after every use. They're expensive. They're upwards of 200 bucks a pop. They're not cheap. It's not a toy. It's not a little kid's toy. Okay, so treat it really well and it will treat you well. Again, make sure that it is rigged properly. You'll also see in the back, okay, the little bridle strings here. You can see how that's twisted around the spar. You don't want that. You want to make sure that you take the time to straighten out all of your lines and that the kite's ready to go. You can attach split shots to kites on the corners to help them fly in either direction if you're going to fly multiple kites. This is nothing more than a wing. That's really all it is. So if you're flying multiple kites, you obviously want one kite to veer off to the right and one kite to veer off to the left. And by simply attaching so small split shots to the corners, you'll help fly that kite in the right direction. Once you get that kite to fly properly, you know, for example, if this is going to be 
the kite that you fish off the bow that flies to the right, generally you'll keep it that way. You're not going to mix and match them. You know, you can take a black magic marker and just put a little hash mark on there, you know, something to indicate that that's your bow kite. You know, once they're fine-tuned, they tend to do really well, but again, it requires a lot of effort and time to make sure that that kite flies well. So, we now have our kites. You know, there's some other things that we need. For example, tomorrow we're going to go kite fishing. There's not going to be any wind whatsoever. So what do we need in order to get our kite to fly properly? We need balloons. We need helium balloons, okay? Nothing more than a 36-inch glorified balloon, just a big, giant latex balloon, okay? And obviously, you need some helium to fill this up. There are two options. One option is to go to Party City right there and to buy for 35 bucks a disposable little pink helium balloon container that you can fill up balloons with. Problem with that is number one, it's 35 bucks for a disposable tank that you're only going to use one time. It will fill two balloons. You know, you do the math. Another option is a fixed system, something like this, okay? Just an oxygen tank that we fill with helium, has a little gauge right on there. This is mounted below deck in a hatch, and it has a long, obviously, cord, okay? And filled with helium. This will fill six to seven balloons and costs 80 bucks to fill. Where do you fill this? A lot of guys say, where do I get my helium system filled? And you get it filled at a welding shop, okay? Welding shops have the helium, they'll fill them. Helium, though, is getting more and more expensive, okay? Keep in mind, you need it because without a helium tank, it's nearly impossible when there's absolutely no wind to get that kite to fly properly, okay? To get it to fly at all. So make sure that you're well equipped with that helium. And like I said, at the very least, last minute, if you know you're going to go kite fishing and there's not going to be any wind, go to Party City, get yourself a disposable container. After you do that about 10 or 12 times, then you'll invest in an actual fixed system. Okay? Um, in addition to that, we've talked about the bait. We've talked about the rods, about the kite, about the balloons. Now, obviously, you need some additional accessories. I like to keep all of my kite gear in one container, one simple little container. Everything I need for kite fishing is in this one container. The guy up fishing the bow or on the other corner of the stern can grab it if he needs it. And there's a variety of different products in here, a variety of different essentials that you absolutely need to be an effective kite fisherman for sailfish. Number one, bunch of balloons, okay? And don't just bring one because you'll tend to pop them, okay? I certainly have done it and I'm sure you will as well. So make sure you've got some spare balloons. Have some black electrical tape, really important, and we're going to explain why in a second. Extra clips, okay, for your kite rod. Sometimes these will fail, okay, they'll break, the little spring mechanism won't work properly. Make sure to check your clips, and as a matter of fact, make sure to check those clips regularly, okay, before you go kite fishing to make sure that that little snap opens and closes the way it's supposed to, the way it was designed to. If that does not open, okay, and release your line, you're gonna have a big problem, okay? It's potentially turned into a giant nightmare. So make sure that your release clips are, are working perfectly, okay? So have plenty of spares of those. You're gonna need some ceramic rings, and we're gonna talk about that when we talk about how to, ring the, how to rig the rods, okay? The ceramic ring goes right on your line, and this is what you're going to attach to the release clip up on your kite line. You're not going to run your line, your monofilament, through the release clip, okay, because you can damage chafing the line or it could get caught on that sharp little metal edge right there on that release clip. So we use little ceramic rings. So this way the line goes through the ring, the ring is attached to the clip, and that's what pops open the clip, and the line never touches the actual release clip. Floats. You need plenty of kite floats. These come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and a lot of different colors. Some guys, you know, this is the most common kite float that you've ever seen. 
Okay, right? It's a very, very common. This is a staple. However, there's a lot of other designs. You know, here's a different design that's actually weighted. It has a little weight in the bottom and obviously a different color. Why are they different colors? Reason being, if I'm fishing three baits, I can have a green float on my short, I can have a pink float on my medium, and a you know, yellow or a chartreuse float on my long. So it just makes it a little bit easier to track your baits, what the short bait is, what the long bait is. I can tell you when we're out filming Florida Sport Fishing TV, I like to fish the multiple colored floats because it's easier for my camera guy when I say, hey, the green float, the green float. Okay, he can instantly key in on that green float and zoom in on that fish, that sailfish that is about to eat my uh, goggle eye. But you, again, you don't have to. That's the staple right there. Keep in mind, if it is really windy, very, very windy, you want to be careful. You don't want to fish a really large float because that wind will catch that float and will pull that bait up and out of the water. So when it's really windy, be careful on that size of that float. You may want to downsize a little bit. On the other hand, when there's no wind at all, get rid of your floats altogether. There are days we'll go out there and kite fish when there's no wind and we're trying to reduce our terminal signature altogether. We'll eliminate the kite floats and we'll fish straight with no float at all. Okay, keep in mind, you don't need a float to kite fish. Your bait's in the water. He's either in the water or he's in the air. It's one or the other. Okay, so keep them in the water. And he doesn't have to be right on the surface. Don't make that mistake of thinking that your goggle eye has to be right on the surface, you know, twitching out. As a matter of fact, it's better if he's suspended a little bit below the surface. He'll swim a little bit easier. He won't kill himself as quickly from all of that strain right up on the surface. So as long as, you know, again, that bait's in the water, you're okay. You're going to need some wax rigging floss, okay? Wax rigging floss. You can use this to bridle your baits, although we use rubber bands, but it's a good backup. But you also need to wax rigging floss to tie, to tie your helium balloon to the back of the kite. Okay, you don't want to use monofilament because when you snip it, the little sharp edge potentially will pop that balloon. Anybody ever make that mistake? You will, okay? Telling you the soft wax rigging floss. Rigging needles, you're gonna need a bunch of rigging needles. Don't only bring one, bring six, okay? Because you're gonna lose these. They have a tendency to just disappear on the boat. So you're gonna need rigging needles to bridle your bait, and we're gonna talk about bridling baits in a minute. Beads, okay, another thing that you're gonna need, we rig with beads in between our sinker and our snap swivel. We put a small little plastic bead, and I'll show it to you in a second, so this way when that sinker bounces up and down, it doesn't damage the knot. And I know you're probably saying, boy, this sounds really intricate and detail-oriented. You bet your ass it is. When $75,000 is on the line, it's very intricate and it's very detail-oriented. And when you put in all of this time and effort and all of this money to, or time to go catch bait or buy bait and you want to go out there, every single bite makes a difference. Every single fish makes a difference. How many days, I've said this in every one of my seminars, how many times can one fish change an entire trip? Am I right? Okay, so you don't want to miss those opportunities. And there's nothing I hate more than losing a fish due to something that I could have prevented. I call that angler failure or tackle failure. If you eliminate angler failure and tackle failure from the equation, you're going to be a far more successful fisherman. Okay? You're also going to need some small little egg sinkers, anything from a sixteenth of an ounce all the way up to a half ounce. We use these little egg sinkers, and again, I'll show you how they come into play, but we use these little egg sinkers when it's really breezy. What these do is they help keep that bait in the water. Remember what I said to you, when it's really windy, you've got 20, 30 knots of wind that is sweeping across and pushing all of that line and that float and it tends to pull that bait up and out of the water. So we add the appropriate egg sinkers, the appropriate lead, to maintain that vertical presentation coming straight down from the kite into the water to maintain that, like I said, that vertical presentation. Split shots in a variety of sizes to attach 
to the side of the kites. Just a little pinch on split shots that you would use in any other type of fishery. Make sure you've got a variety of little split shots. Hooks. We are sail fishing. We are not fishing J hooks. We are primarily catch and release fishing. Okay, we never kill a sailfish except if we've done everything that we can, there are going to be times where a sailfish comes up dead. He was tail wrapped, whatever happened, and you've done everything you can to revive that fish because it's worth far more alive than dead. Okay, so we never want to harvest one of those fish. However, it has happened. Okay, but when we go out there targeting sailfish, we are specifically fishing circle hooks. This is a VMC 90 tournament inline circle hook. I point out in line because when you are tournament fishing, you cannot use an offset hook. It has to be in line. Okay, otherwise you risk hooking that fish in the throat, in the stomach. So all tournaments require you to fish an inline non-stainless steel circle hook. And that VMC 90 is a perfect option. Okay. We also have some smaller size circle hooks, 5.0s, 6.0s, 7.0s. Why? Because if for whatever reason we can't get our hands on goggle eyes and we have to fish pilchards, which are also a great bait for sailfish, we want to downsize our hook. Okay, we want to downsize that hook because you don't want to take a small little puny three or four inch very lightweight bait and put it on a big clunky 9-0 hook. Okay, you're going to you know, really hurt the way that that fish swims and the way you're presenting that bait. So it's a good idea to have some, you know, some smaller size circle hooks. Swivels, you're going to need when you rig your kite rod, and again, this isn't a beginner seminar. You know, I asked who's been kite fishing. The vast majority of you, of you raised your hands. You know that you need different size swivels on your kite rod depending on your clip. So make sure that you have those swivels, small little snap swivels, okay, also important, little diamond ball bearing, 75 pound snap swivels. And of course, as I mentioned, bunch of little rubber bands, nothing fancy, just some small little rigging bands. This is what we use to bridle the bait. We never put the circle hook in the goggle eye. We always bridle the bait. It will prevent that bait from, you know, dying and it'll really maintain the best presentation possible. And that's the goal. The goal is to go out there and present these baits in as natural a fashion as possible. Because like I said, the more lively that bait is, the more aggressive that bait is, the more attention it's going to attract and the more bites that you're going to get. So we've talked all about that. You know, again, just the hooks, 90 VMC inline circle hooks are leader. The leader that we're fishing is diamond presentation, 40 pound fluorocarbon, okay, 40 pound. 20 years ago, guys were sail fishing with 100 pound leaders. 10 years ago, they were sail fishing with 60 to 80 pound leaders. Today, we're sail fishing with 40 pound leaders. These fish are getting smarter, okay, the pressure is increasing, and truthfully, there's no reason you can't fish with 40 pound. So our leaders are 12 to 15 feet long, and it's 40 pound diamond presentation. So let's get to the rig itself. Again, we talked about the rod. It's a Chaos KC 15 to 30, rated for 15 to 30 pound line, seven foot rod. It's a composite rod, okay? The rig itself, the end of our line, our 20 pound diamond line, our high vis diamond line, we've doubled that up. You can use a spider hitch, you can, I'm sorry, a surgeon's knot or a, a bimini twist, of course, is the best, and you can double up that line. Keep in mind, if you are tournament fishing, the total length of your double line and your leader cannot exceed 20 feet. So if you are fishing a 15, a 15 foot leader, how long can my double line be? Five feet. Okay, if you're fishing a 12 foot leader, you can fish an eight foot double line. And keep in mind, when you are tournament fishing, an official release is when you touch that leader. Okay, so you don't have to touch the fish, you just have to get the fish within 15 feet of the boat. And somebody has to touch the leader, that is an official catch and an official release. So from our double line, the first thing that we've done is put on our little ceramic ring that we talked about. See it right there, kind of dangling? 
Okay, just a little ceramic ring. That's the first thing that we slide up on our line when we're rigging this outfit. And that's the ring that's gonna sit up in that release clip that we talked about. The next thing we're gonna do is slide our float on the line. Again, this is just your standard, typical pink kite float. You know, this is the standard in the industry, what you'll see more than anything else. But there are a lot of options, and as I mentioned, don't forget, when there's no wind at all, don't be afraid to eliminate those floats altogether. Beneath that float, you'll see here, this is rigged for a day when there's quite a bit of breeze, there are two egg sinkers right there. Two half ounce, half ounce egg sinkers to keep that presentation vertical, okay? You can adjust these, in other words, the size. You can put one, you can put two. It's not set it and forget it. You're out there, you've gotta pay attention to what's going on. I'm looking at my bait and I'm having a hard time keeping that bait in the water, especially my far bait, my long bait. Because keep in mind, I'm fishing three baits off my kite. And my long bait is not going to react the same as my short bait. Why? because I've got a lot more line going all the way up to my far, my long release clip, and all the way back down to the water. So the wind has a much greater opportunity of catching that longer line, and it's gonna sweep that bait up and out of the water. So on my long bait, I may have to fish two egg sinkers to keep that bait in the water if it's really breezy. On my short bait, I may not have to fish any lead. Okay, any lead at all. So you really have to adapt to the situation. Okay, like I said earlier, you know, listen, anybody can go out, put a bait in the water, and catch a fish. You know, th that's the bottom line, and catch a sailfish. However, to do it consistently, day in and day out, regardless of conditions, and to really maximize your time on the water, kite fishing for these you know, majestic, beautiful fish, you really gotta be dialed in, and you gotta put in the time, and the effort, and the work. You know, it's not just fun and games. You gotta really put in some effort to be successful at kite fishing for sailfish consistently, and to rack up, you know, double digit releases. Because if you wanna go out there, you know, and release 10, 12, 15 sailfish in a day, you really need to be on point. Below the egg sinkers is that little bead that we talked about. Just that small little plastic bead to protect that knot right there from those leads chafing that knot. And if that happens and that knot breaks, premature tackle failure and you just lost the fish that you, know, you could have saved. Below that is that small little snap swivel and that's where we attach our leader. It's very, very simple. 12 to 15 feet of that 40 pound diamond presentation Okay, tied with a small loop knot to that 9-0 VMC circle hook. Very simple. If there's no wind whatsoever, again, I'm gonna go to this setup, which is exactly the same rod, okay, exactly the same outfit with a small little snap on the end, but you can see there's no hardware, there's no junk, there's nothing that that wind is gonna catch, okay? And, and I wanna say, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, I said we go out there with 12 rods and reels, and they're matching rods and reels, okay? And you'll see all of these tournament teams on the back of their boats in their cockpits are gonna have all pretty matching rods and reels. There's, you know, a number of benefits to that. Imagine if you're fishing three different kite rods off the same kite, and they're different rods with different reels with different lines. Okay, and one of them's a lever drag, it's a pen whatever, and one of them's a Daiwa something, and one of them's a Shimano something. Whatever you have laying around in your garage. It could get really confusing as to the drag setting on this, the drag setting on that. By keeping everything consistent across the board, it's very easy to go from one rod to the next, and you know exactly how that outfit performs. You know exactly how much drag pressure you can put on that line, how much heat you can put on that fish. You know exactly how that reel works. You have an intimate relationship with your tackle. And my, while you may think that I'm getting a little bit deep, I'm not. That's what's required to really be a successful sail fisherman, is you have to have that intimate relationship with all of your gear, your kites, your kite rod, and of course your rod and reels, your outfits that you're fishing, okay? So we've got our rods ready, you know, we've got all our equipment ready, we're now heading out, we're going out Hillsborough Inlet tomorrow morning. Fortunately for us, we are in the sailfish capital of the world. 
Okay, that one fish right there has made Florida famous and certainly South Florida famous. People travel from all over the world to you know, get in on our hot sailfish bite. It's remarkable. We're so fortunate where you can go out Hillsboro Inlet, go one mile off the inlet, one mile, stop the boat, put the kites up, and catch a sailfish tomorrow morning. One mile. There's nowhere else that you can do that. I can't tell you how many guys call me from the Gulf Coast or up in Jacksonville. They're so jealous. They're like, oh my God, you guys go right out the inlet. You're in deep water. You're catching all of these fish. You know, we've got to travel 40, 60, 80, 100 miles to get into deep water. Not us. We are very, very fortunate. And when the bite's on, like I said right now, if you can find those conditions right out front, you only have to go a mile. Okay, you don't have to travel far. Our biggest, you know, longest journeys when we're sail fishing is never offshore. It's either are we fishing south or are we fishing north? Are we running 50 miles or, you know, 25 to 50 miles to go anywhere from Boynton to Jupiter or 25 to 50 miles to run down to Hallover or Government Cut or Fowey and fish south? It's never out, it's just south or north. But we're always, of course, within sight of land and right on the edge. Okay, and what do I mean by right on the edge? Okay, that's really important. That edge, you know, we've got some reef lines that parallel our coastline, but more importantly, we're looking for that edge of nice, clean blue water. This guy does not like dirty brown water. He doesn't like that pea soup green water that King Mackerel like. He likes that nice, beautiful cobalt blue water, and he loves current. He likes current, especially a northerly current. However, any current is better than no current. But he really, really likes that clean water. So whenever we go kite fishing, even when we're filming, the first thing I do is I leave Hillsborough Inlet and I go straight out, okay? If I can find the conditions that I'm looking for right out front, I'm not going anywhere, okay? If I can't find the conditions that I'm looking for, which change every day because that edge meanders in and out, water clarity changes, so many different factors change from one day to the next. Well, really, with fishing, they change from one minute to the next. But again, right now, we do have some really good conditions right out front. So tomorrow morning, when you're going sail fishing, go right out front a mile off the beach and start looking for good conditions. The depth, you can kite fish for sailfish in as deep as three to 500 feet of water, and you can kite fish for sailfish in 50 to 80 feet of water. But the key depth is really 80 to 180. That's that magic avenue, 80 to 180 feet. Some days are a little bit deeper, some days are a little bit shallower, but you can't go wrong with that 80 to 180 foot. Now you've got to make a decision. When you go out there, out Hillsborough Inlet, and you find that nice clean water, and there's birds flying around, there's some scattered weed, there's some bait around, and keep in mind right now, there's ballyhoo all over the reef line. There's Spanish mackerel, there's kingfish. The ocean is alive right now, right out in this area. So as long as you find all of those key factors, there's no reason you can't set up right out front or somewhere local, but you need to make a decision. Are you gonna be drifting or are you gonna be powering into the current? And here's what I mean. If you're only two people on the boat and there's no one that can you know, man the wheel the entire time and you wanna fly two kites and there's one guy up in the bow and one guy in the stern, you're gonna drift. Okay, you're gonna drift through that area. The good part about that is you're covering some ground and let's just assume there's gonna be a northeast breeze. So if I started in 250 foot, it's gonna push me in, okay, all the way in shallower to 80 foot, okay? So I can cover some ground there and fish different depths. The downside is once I get too shallow, what do I gotta do? Okay, I've gotta retrieve six baits, three from each kite, bring those kites in, run back out, and reset everything back up. And it's not, you know, when you're dialed in, it doesn't take a lot of time, I can tell you. It's not a tremendous amount of time, but it does take some, some effort. Obviously, you're reeling in three lines. My guy up in the bow, Carlos, he's reeling in his three lines. Then we gotta bring our kites in. Then I gotta convince my camera guy to hold my kite while I run back offshore, okay? And he hates doing that. 
okay, and then setting everything back up again and rebridling fresh baits. Or if there's enough people on the boat, I can keep that bow pointed right into the breeze and I can fly my two kites right off the stern, one here, one here, and maintain the boat's position. That's how all of the tournament guys are doing it. Why? Because they're maximizing their time on the water. They don't have to go back and forth every time to reset their drift. Their kites are up and they stay up. Their baits are in the water and they're, they're fishing nonstop and they're able to maintain their position by bumping in and out of the current or in and out of the breeze. Of course, whichever stronger, usually the breeze. You know, and they can maintain that position. So if the bite's at 150 to 180, you can hold that boat in 150 to 180 foot of water the entire time. So you're maximizing your time in the strike zone. Does that make sense? Versus sweeping and drifting across the entire strike zone and then having to reset. But again, to do it that way, the tournament way we'll call it, requires more people on the boat, requires a, a, a captain who's dedicated to manning the wheel and not moving. Okay? His job is to run that boat and it's your job to fish those baits off the stern. And I'm going to tell you that on these tournament teams, you know, there's, there's something that you may or may not know. When I go out kite fishing, and we're not tournament fishing, we're fun fishing or we're filming, I'm fishing a kite and I'm fishing three baits and I'm working all three of those baits and that kite rod. On a tournament team, there are four people doing exactly what I'm doing. Each guy has one rod. And then there's a guy who's working the kite rod. Okay, they're all dedicated to that one rod. So this way when they set their baits, it's as fast as possible and they're able to, to really maintain an awesome presentation when a fish is on they're still fishing their other baits because that captain may be moving that boat to gain line as quickly as possible because tournament sail fishing is a numbers game. It's not about enjoying the sport. Well, I mean, not to say that they don't enjoy the sport. Of course they do. But it's about releasing that fish as quickly as possible and catching another one and potentially turning that one bite into two bites. So if I'm focused on fighting a fish, my other two baits are kind of being neglected a little bit. But if two other guys are staying on top of those baits, they're making sure that they stay in the water and they're able to you know, turn one bite into multiple bites. It's a team effort. Kite fishing for sailfish is not a one-man show. It's a team effort from everybody that's on the boat. And we like to say, regardless of who's reeling the fish in, we all caught those fish. You know, we did it together as a team, regardless if it was the guy on the wheel, the guy on the rod, or the guy who's doing nothing but handing us baits. On the subject of baits, and I just want to touch on one more thing. You know, we talked about the goggle eyes earlier. These guys, these tournament teams, are so meticulous about their baits that they literally will scoop them out of their bait pens one at a time. They will not put two baits in a bait net when they're scooping them from a bait pen to put them in the boat in the morning. They will not put multiple baits in one bait net because those baits slapping up against each other will wipe some of that slime off and some of those scales off. And it's kind of like road rash. When you wipe that slime off of a bait fish, it's literally like road rash. And that bait will be hurt and he will not swim as frisky as he could. So they will literally, meticulously, one at a time, pick those baits out. They also, a lot of these guys have special nets with special mesh that's really, really soft. Almost like a a skimmer for your pool with a really fine mesh versus a harsh mesh that could potentially harm that bait. So they treat those baits like gold because again, there's so much on the line. So they really, really take very good care of those baits. You know, I've seen so many people who say, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. You can scoop a big pile of bait out of the bait pen and throw it in a bait well, or you can handle those baits. Absolutely not. Never touch the bait. The only time you are ever touching that live bait is to bridle, you know, to take your circle hook and to bridle it into that bait. From the time they are caught, they are never touched by anyone's hands because, again, that will wipe the slime off that bait. They really treat their goggle eyes like gold. 
So getting back to it, we went out and we've got to make that decision. Are we drifting or are we powering into the current? You know, unless you're tournament fishing and you've got an entire team on the boat, like I said, I'm going to assume that you're going to be drifting. If you've never kite fished, I would highly suggest you go out and start with one bait off of one kite. Get that dialed in first, okay, before you even attempt to fish two kites or three kites, okay, with three baits off of each kite. And keep in mind, kite fishing, you know, you may be wondering how or where somebody got the idea to take a kite, you know, and, and to fly it and how that all came about. It really all started in Polynesia years and years and years ago. And they created these kites from large leaves, from like banana trees, okay? Somebody got a bright idea of somehow creating some sort of kite from a big leaf. And what they used to do is find this particular type of spider. And you're probably going, what the heck is he talking about? Just follow me here for a second. This particular type of spider that, ha that had this web and they used to take the web and curl it up into what appeared to be a silky little worm. And that's what they dangled off the kite. Didn't even have a hook in it. And they were targeting needlefish up on the surface. And the needlefish would see these little worm-like, flashy, yarny things. And they would think that it was some sort of bait fish. And they would snatch onto it. And if anybody knows needlefish, kind of like a guard, has a whole bunch of little teeth, and they would get stuck with the web in their mouths. And these Polynesian primitive fishermen would then pull them in and catch these needlefish that they then ate. That's where kite fishing started. It has since, and I'm sure that they never dreamed that it would evolve into the science that it is today. Okay, with the equipment that we have today, you know, the modern boats and of course the modern tackle and, you know, specialized kites for different wind conditions. I'm sure they would have never dreamed that would have come to this. The benefit of kite fishing, of course, is that not only can we present baits right on the surface in the strike zone, because that's where that guy's feeding. You see, he's designed in a really special way to feed up on the surface. For starters, counter shading, that dark blue across the top of his body. When there's a bait fish like a ballyhoo or a sardine or a herring or any other type of bait fish up toward the surface, it can't see that sailfish below it because of that counter shading up on top. It's designed with a giant sail that it uses to corral the bait fish. Okay, they swim across, you know, pods of bait fish, they open up that sail and they create a much larger profile and they corral all of those bait fish into a tight little ball. And then when all those bait fish are corralled into that tight little ball, they'll come in and they'll swipe at them with that sharp bill. They don't stab the bait, they swipe at it and they hit it to wound it and disorient it. And when they hit that bait, that one bait fish out of the whole pod and they disorient it, they turn really quickly and they go pop and they eat it and suck it down. And there's usually multiple sailfish working together. I'm sure you've seen all of these incredible underwater videos of sailfish not only here in the Atlantic, but of course in the Pacific, okay, that corral all of these bait balls. It's absolutely mesmerizing to watch these fish hunt. You know, it really is. But they hunt toward the surface. So kite fishing allows us to present baits right in that strike zone, right up on top, okay? More importantly, it allows us to present baits on the downwind side of the boat, okay? On the downwind side of the boat. Because of course, on the upwind side of the boat, we couldn't fly a kite. It would be pushing it in our faces. We can fish flat lines, but not kite lines. So it allows us to achieve a 360 degree presentation all around the boat. Really, really important. While you are kite fishing for sailfish, certainly there's some bycatch, okay? King mackerel, wahoo, blackfin tuna, cobia, and of course, dolphin. Because everything eats goggle eyes, everything eats herring and ballyhoo, and you can't determine what game fish comes by, you know, and eats your bait, so you never know what you may hook. But when you are specifically targeting these sailfish, you're not fishing any wire leader because they have great eyesight. 
So we reduce our terminal signature and we fish that straight 40 pound fluorocarbon. So we risk getting cut off by Wahoo and risk getting cut off by Kingfish. But that's the price you pay when you are sail fishing because again, that's the species that we are specifically targeting. So we go out there, we found those really nice conditions, okay? Really nice conditions. We've got some nice clean water, we've got some birds, we've got some scattered weed, and you know, we're gonna put it on a drift. The first thing we're gonna do, of course, is stop the boat. You know, if I wanna fish in 180 foot of water, I'm gonna go out to 180 foot of water and I'm gonna stop the boat. I'm not gonna put a single bait in the water. We're gonna stop the boat, we're gonna get all of our gear ready, we're gonna get everything ready to deploy, and I'm gonna then look on my chart plotter, okay, and I'm gonna see exactly which way I'm drifting. Because keep in mind, that drift may not be the way that you think it is, because the current affects your drift tremendously. So even if you have an east wind that's pushing you in, that current may be pushing you north, or it may be pushing you south. So I always look at that chart plotter to determine exactly which way I'm drifting so I can then position the boat in a way where I'm going to cover prime territory, okay? And as long as those conditions are there, we're going to give it a shot. You know, you may not see any fish in the area and you certainly may not read any on your sounder. Don't think that you need or that you're going to read a bunch of sailfish on your fish finder. Okay? You're not going to. You're drifting across an area. These fish are moving down the beach. You're not going to see them on your sounder. You're going to cross paths with fish as they're moving down. So don't look for marks on your machine. Certainly if you see bait, you know, bait marks, obviously that's a great indication because obviously where there's bait, potentially there's game fish as well. We're going to set our kite baits up. We will generally fish two kites, like I said, with three baits off of each kite. If we have an opportunity to have multiple baits on, on the boat, multiple types of bait, not only goggle eyes, but also pilchards, or maybe some ballyhoo, we'll try and mix it up. Okay, and again, some of these tournament teams as well, they'll go out there with goggle eyes, they'll go out there with speedos, they'll go out there with thread fin herring. These are all great baits for sailfish. You know, in some days the fish tend to have a preference for one over the other so they can adjust accordingly. Also, they will adjust their tackle. Okay, on my long bait, on the far bait that's far away from the boat, we may fish a 16 pound outfit rather than a 20 pound test outfit. We may fish a 16 pound class outfit. Why? Because we have more line on the reel on that far bait. It catches less wind as well. So there's some benefits of fishing some lighter rods on your far baits, on your long baits, you know, versus your close baits. When you're tournament fishing also, you are only entitled to fish how many lines? Anybody know? Seven. Okay. I mean, depending on the tournament. Usually it's seven lines. Okay. Some will be a little bit more strict, but it's seven. So you can fish two kites with three baits off of each kite, and then usually there's somebody fishing a spinning rod up off the bow. Sometimes you'll see tailors. A tailor is a sailfish that's literally just riding a wave. Okay, he's riding a wave, moving down the beach, looks like that black garbage bag that we talked about. Suddenly you just see what appears to be a black garbage bag floating down sea. That's a sailfish right up on the surface. So having that spinning rod rigged and ready, you can just toss a bait to that fish, you land it right in front of them, and oftentimes they'll just snatch it, you know, and you can maximize on that bite as well. Like I said, when we're drifting, you've got to pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to how fast you're drifting, you know, what direction you're drifting in. We'll fish an area, I'll do a drift through an area. If I don't get any bites at all, I'm out of there. Okay, I'm out of there. If I don't get any bites on that first drift and the conditions look right, I'm gone. Okay, and I'm going to run up the beach or down the beach. I'm going to look for fishier water. I'm going to look for something that's just a little bit different. On the other hand, if I'm fishing a particular area and we get a bite, two bites, three bites on a drift, am I going to do that drift over again? You bet I am, okay, because obviously there's fish there and it doesn't have to just be sailfish. You know, we don't have to go out tomorrow with the intention of catching 15 to 20 sailfish. You catch three or four, aren't you going to be happy? If 
By show of hands, you're going to be happy? I'm going to be happy, right? You're right? You catch one, okay? But certainly, you catch three or four throughout the day, you're going to be thrilled, all right? So you don't have to think, you know, so hardcore like these tournament guys. But if you know what they're doing, and if you really think about the nuances and the details, you know, it's going to help you be a more successful angler as well. Keep that in mind. Uh, but like I said, you know, if we go through an area, we get a couple of bites, maybe it's a kingfish bite, maybe it's a dolphin bite, and it's not the sailfish. I'm going to keep fishing that area as long as I keep getting bites, plus, you know, there's nothing the matter with throwing a few gaffers in the box while you're sail fishing as well, right? Some nice dolphin. So I'm going to keep fishing that area because if there's something that's attracting those other pelagic migratory game fish, certainly this guy's not too far behind. Okay, he's not too far behind. And keep in mind, it's a very fast growing fish, you know, kind of like dolphin. Everybody knows dolphin grow fast. I know this isn't a dolphin seminar, but just a quick tidbit for you about dolphin. You know, dolphin grow how fast in one year? Anybody know? Okay. A dolphin can grow up to 40 pounds in one year. Up to 40 pounds in one year. <laughs> Sailfish grow very fast as well maybe not 40 pounds in a year, but certainly 20 to 30 pounds in a year. Okay, they're a very, very fast growing fish. They eat a lot. They exert a tremendous amount of energy. Their migratory path is hundreds, thousands of miles. Does anybody know where these fish are going? Anybody want to take a guess? Where? Mexico. Okay, they're going all the way down and around to Mexico. They've got a long journey ahead of them. And then they're going to turn around and come back. Okay, so they expend a tremendous amount of energy on their migratory route. You know, up in South Carolina. Okay, yep. You can catch them a little bit further than that as well, but not very often. You know, no one up in New Jersey is targeting <laughs> sailfish. Although they have been caught up there. You know, ironically, I mean, sailfish, you know, have such a broad range. I mean, of course, the Bahamas and even offshore, you could be out a you know, in a thousand feet or two thousand feet trolling for dolphin in the middle of the summer and catch a sailfish. What he was doing there, I have no idea, but certainly a possibility. The piers, you could be standing on a pier and catch a sailfish. How about that? Right? How exciting is that for, you know, th these kids and whoever fishing these piers and they catch a sailfish? You know, or hook a sailfish. It's rare that they land it, but certainly possible. So they really swim far and wide. But their migratory path really brings them from that, you know, kind of like I said, that 80 to 200 foot. That's their avenue where they're traveling down the beach. At night, too, we've heard stories from divers who tell us that they're out there diving at night, and this guy is just laying right on the bottom, sleeping that pods of sailfish, five to ten fish together, will just be laying right on the bottom. And I don't mean laying flat, hovering right over the bottom, just resting and not moving at all. Okay, so really extraordinary fish, it really is. I mean, like I said, designed to be an apex predator. You know, it really is. And they're worth so much more alive. So you've got to be careful with these fish, you know, when you're releasing them. One thing that happens a lot, you'll hook a sailfish, and it will regurgitate its stomach, and you'll see its stomach hanging out of its mouth. And a lot of people are like, what in the world is going on? That's a natural tendency. What they do is when they eat bony fish, if they get a bone stuck in them, they'll regurgitate their entire stomach, and their whole stomach will be hanging out of their mouth. So that's very common when you're fighting these fish, that that reflex, they do that. They'll regurgitate their stomach to try and dislodge whatever foreign object, obviously they don't know it's a VMC 9 hook, okay? They don't know what it is, but they know something is wrong, so they regurgitate their stomach. Don't worry about trying to put that stomach back in the fish's mouth. It has a reflex and it will automatically do that on its own. So don't think that that fish is harmed or is going to die. It won't. However, handle that fish cautiously. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I see pictures of people and they'll grab a sailfish, they got it up next to the boat, they'll drag it up over the gunnel, they'll wipe it across their shirts, they're holding it up for a picture. Really nice, but that fish is now dead.
He's dead. He's going to die, 100%. You've wiped all the slime off the fish. He's going to get an infection, and a hammerhead shark's going to eat him. Okay? The sharks eat these things all day long. So be very careful. Keep the fish in the water. Also, their, their sail, a lot of people will grab their sail, and it's so fragile. Okay? It's like silk. You know, it's, it's such a really neat membrane. But it's also very, because it is so fragile, it's susceptible to damage. And a lot of times you'll see sails that are sliced. You know, so oftentimes that happens from the line or sometimes from just handling that fish too rough. So be very careful when you're handling that as well. You know, ideally speaking, you're probably better off not even touching the fish at all. Okay, and just cutting the leader as close to that fish's mouth as you can. If you can get that circle hook out of the corner of the fish's mouth without hurting it, great, do it. But if you're going to jeopardize harming that fish, don't do it. Just reach down, cut that leader as close to the you know, fish's mouth, and watch it swim away. If the fish is struggling, you know, it's been a long fight, maybe it was tail wrapped, who knows, then you need to revive the fish. You obviously want to keep that fish in the water next to the boat pop the boat in gear and try and get some water running through that fish's mouth over its gills, you know, and sometimes that takes five minutes and sometimes it takes 25 minutes. But there's nothing more rewarding than watching a beautiful sailfish that you just caught swim away healthy and unharmed, okay? Like I said, we, we really do the very best that we can to let everyone go, but the truth is I would say probably one a year ends up coming back for the smoker, coming back to the smoker. Sailfish make absolutely awesome fish dip. Okay, it's the only way that I even recommend eating them. I don't know if you've ever seen the flesh on a sailfish, but it's just bloody red. Okay, it's almost like a bonita. It's really, really red, and when you look at it, it doesn't look very appetizing. But again, smoked, they're absolutely delicious. But that's just the last resort. Do everything you can do to release these fish unharmed. So we're out there fishing. We get a bite. You know, we're, we see our goggle eye. He's up on the top. We see that garbage bag swimming around. Really awesome sight. And 90% of the time, you will see that bite before it happens, okay? You'll see that fish come up on that goggle eye. He eats that bait. You reel tight pops out of the clip, reel up all of the slack. Okay, remember your fishing circle hooks. So don't be, a, you know, Roland Martin, a bass master, swinging back, okay, trying to bury that hook into the fish. Let that circle hook do its job. Just point the rod tip, right, you know, point the line and the rod tip right at the fish and just reel up all of that slack until you come tight. And that circle hook will come out of that fish's throat and catch right in the corner of the mouth. And that is why we bridle the baits. And what I mean by bridling the bait is we'll take a small rubber band and we'll, might be a little hard for you to see, but we'll take a small rigging band. It could either be, here's a clear band, there's black bands, red bands, okay? Whatever the case, and that rigging band goes around the bend of the hook, the bend of the circle hook, right on the bottom where my thumb is, is where that little loop is with that band. Then with the use of a rigging needle, okay, a little rigging needle, you'll grab one side of the rubber band and you'll go through the back of the bait fish, right in the center, right by its dorsal fin. Okay, and then all you simply do is just loop that circle hook back up through the rubber band. And what ends up happening is the hook itself is fully exposed. That entire hook is outside of the bait. No part of that hook is in the bait. Just a little part of the, the rigging band is holding that hook into the bait. Again, the bait will stay much more frisky, but more importantly, because that entire circle hook is exposed, it has a much greater chance of catching right in the corner of that fish's mouth. Takes a little bit of practice, but once you do it 3,000 times, you'll be a star. Okay, it's really, really simple, okay? So again, when we get that bite, it's really important to pay attention to what's going on because oftentimes you'll get, you'll turn one fish into two fish, sometimes even into three fish. So don't only focus on that one fish, pay attention to the rest of your baits as well. 
while you're fighting that fish, do the best that you can to get that fish to the boat as quickly as possible without jeopardizing busting them off, you know. I I've caught so many of these things, but as I mentioned earlier, every one of them is so exciting, you know. They jump, some of them spend the entire fight in the air, tail, tail walking, you know, all around the boat, and it's just unbelievably exciting. Other fish won't jump at all. You know, they may only jump once or twice. You know, everyone's a little bit different. Um, but, you know, again, they're just so exciting. Know your tackle. Know how much heat, how much pressure, how much drag you can apply on that fish without something coming undone, without premature tackle failure. You know, I do this not only, you know, with all my gear, especially when I'm bottom fishing, and, and the same applies. If you get hung up in the bottom, and this doesn't apply to sail fishing, you're obviously not fishing in the bottom, but anybody ever get hung up in the bottom when you're bottom fishing? Okay, everybody has gotten hung up in the bottom at some point or another. Okay, lock up your drag. If you do everything you can to try and get unhung, unrocked, you know, and you can't, lock up that drag and just hold that rod in your hand and pay very close attention to how much tension, how much strain you can put on that outfit before it goes pop and breaks, okay? And by doing that, every time you get hung up, you're gonna get that intimate relationship with that tackle, knowing how much pressure you can put on that line. Keep in mind, monofilament stretches a tremendous amount. Anybody have any idea how much? A third of its length. A third of its length, it's like a giant rubber band. That's why we fish monofilament when we're sail fishing and we don't fish braid. Because when that fish jumps and he's shaking, going crazy like this, if there's no give, if there's no elasticity, if we were fishing straight braid, what would happen when that fish is in the air leaping? We would bust something. Something would break. A knot would break. We would pull a hook out of that fish's mouth. Something would go wrong. So you've got to fish the monofilament whenever you're targeting fish that are jumping, okay, like tarpon, and of course, like sailfish, okay? Yes? Excellent question. So real quick here, his question was, can you use a top shot? In other words, can you fish braided line and fish a monofilament top shot on top of the braid? And the answer is yes, you certainly could at the bare minimum. So in other words, if you are gonna fish braid, make sure you've got a 25 to 50 foot top shot at the bare minimum on top of your braid. However, if you can fish straight mono, I would highly recommend that when you are specifically targeting sailfish. Getting back to the bite, also remember these fish, you know, man, I'll tell you what, they're finicky. You know, they can be really finicky. Some days they won't bite in the morning, they'll only bite in the afternoon. On the other hand, some days they won't bite in the afternoon at all, they'll only bite first thing in the morning. Okay, some days they won't bite at all, all day long. Okay, and you just can't find them. You'll see flappers, okay, what's a flopper? Anybody ever see a flopper? Okay, you're out there and suddenly you see a sailfish just greyhounding, just jumping, flopping across on the surface. Okay, we call that a flopper. Okay, why do they do that? There's different, different philosophies. Anybody know why they do that? That's right, to get rid of parasites. That's what the, you know, the universal belief is, is that they'll jump, you know, and they'll jump and flop on the surface to rid themselves of parasites, okay? If in fact that's true or not, I don't know, I keep asking them and they never told me, okay? But I believe that that's true. So if you'll see floppers, that's certainly a good indication to fish here, right? You know, there's obviously fish in the area, so fish here. Um, but if you don't see what you're looking for, don't be afraid to move, you know, move to a different area. If you're, if you're stuck in that dirty, gnarly water, that greenish water, get out of there. Get out of there. You know, stop wasting your time. Go look for that nice, clean, blue water. You know, we tend to have some really good sail fishing out here, but overall, in general, it's better further north. You know, so if you had to come out of an inlet here at a Boca or Hillsborough, and if you had to pick what direction you're going to go, go north. Okay, go north, for, you know, for the most part. Especially this time of the year, as we progress into, into January and February, then, you know, start looking more toward the south as well. Um, the tournament thing, you know, we were talking about that as well. One, one other thing I want to touch on. 
when you are tournament fishing, as we mentioned earlier, and these guys are holding the boat into the current, like we said, they're also deploy dredges, okay, to attract more attention. And this is just a small collapsible dredge. This is a sure strike dredge, okay. They deploy one and sometimes two dredges with these little mylar baits. And the guy, usually the captain who's running the boat, will fish the dredge rod and he'll constantly work it up and down. And you can see it just mimics a school of bait. Just really flashy, okay, nothing fancy. But imagine one of these off one outrigger and another one off the outrigger in the water next to the boat. They can attract a lot of attention. And even if you're drifting, don't be under the impression that dredges are exclusively for trolling because they're not. We'll use these even when we're running and gunning for dolphin and we'll come along a weed line and we're, we're chunking next to a weed line. I'll throw a dredge off the side of the boat and just tie it to a cleat. And just from the motion of the boat going up and down, this will drive the dolphin crazy. And it does the same thing for the sailfish. So a lot of these tournament teams have stepped it up by also using these attractants because they can't live chum. Okay, so they use this, you know, as some sort of, uh, we'll call it chum, artificial chum, so to speak. So again, the guy usually up in the tower or up on the upper station, he'll fish the dredge rod. We talked about the seasons, you know, we talked about conservation, we talked about the tackle, take your time fighting these fish, you know, enjoy every second of it. Okay, enjoy every second of every sailfish you catch because they're really worth, you know, that enjoyment. There's no magic secret sauce. The secret sauce to successful sail fishing is preparation. If I can stress anything, it's being prepared for everything and being ready to adapt. Because remember, you could go out in the morning and you, there may be no wind at all and I may have to fly my low wind kite but by the afternoon, the breeze picks up and you may have to go all the way up to a high velocity kite, a high wind velocity kite. So by being prepared, you're gonna be able to match the conditions. By having rods rigged, you know, with the lead, and I'm not saying, again, that you need to have a dozen rods, but make sure that you have the appropriate terminal tackle to make those adjustments throughout the day. It's the guy that's willing to put in the time and to put in the effort that's going to walk away the most consistent angler, you know, day in and day out. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, don't let angler failure and tackle failure enter the equation. Anybody ever lose a fish due to a bad knot? Anybody ever lose a fish due to a bad knot? Thank you. Everybody has, okay? We all have something that could have been avoided, okay? It happens, you know, or anybody ever lose a fish because your drag wasn't set properly, okay? That has happened. You know, there's so many different factors. You know, don't let that be part of the game. Be a smarter fisherman. You've got, you know, this nice boat and your time on the water is valuable and you want to make the most out of it. So spend those couple of seconds. You know, we're constantly checking the drag. Every single time I put a bait out, I'm constantly checking my preset drag on my lever drag reel. If it's a star drag reel, do the same. Because remember, on a star drag reel, you have no indication where you are. Okay, if it's a star drag reel, you look at it, all of those arms on the star are identical and there are no indicators on the reel whatsoever as to where you are when it comes to strength of that drag, when it comes to drag pressure. So you have to constantly monitor it when you're fishing a star drag reel because they tend to move on their own. Plus keep in mind the amount of drag on this reel when the reel is loaded with line is different than if this reel was only half full. So if you hook a fish and that fish screams toward the horizon and dumps 200 yards a line, your drag is now different because of the diameter of the spool. So you have to make adjustments. Drags are adjustable. It's not set it and forget it. Companies spend millions of dollars developing these adjustable drag systems in order for you to adjust them. Okay, so take advantage of that. Know your tackle really well. Remember earlier we talked about 
the fresh line. I'm not saying every single time you go sail fishing, you need to dump your entire spool and re-spool. But at the very, very least, you better make sure that that top 100 yards is fresh. Tie a blood knot, peel off, you know, 100 yards of line, tie a blood knot. And I recommend even more than 100 yards, and I'll tell you why. If you have a little blood knot in your line, and this is my long kite bait, what tends to happen? Anybody know? Okay, that little knot gets stuck up in the clip sometimes, okay, or, or stuck up in the ceramic ring, even that small little knot. So, and that can turn into, you know, a nightmare. So, at least, you know, peel down, I'm going to say more than 100 yards, 150 to 200 yards, and make sure that that's fresh line. You know, and if you can, dump the entire spool. And certainly after you catch a few fish, definitely dump the entire spool. Marshall has some great deals on fresh line. I'm sure they'd be very happy to fill every one of your reels, okay, multiple times. So they'll take good care of you, okay? But it's something so minor, but yet it's so important, so important, and so many people neglect it. They neglect the fundamentals. You know, they think, oh, I'm gonna go out there, you know, and I'm gonna do well, and you may, you know, you may go out there and you may catch that one fish, but you could have caught four, okay? You could have caught eight if you would have just paid attention to the details, you know? Don't let that tackle failure, like I said, with the bad knots, you know, enter the equation. Angler failure. Anybody ever go, and not that we're gaffing sailfish, but anybody ever go to gaff a dolphin and you're swinging wildly with the gaff and end up knocking the fish off or wrapping the leader around the end of the gaff? That ever happened to anybody? Okay, that's called angler failure. Okay, or you apply too much drag or you've got a fish next to the boat and you're trying to lift the fish out of the water with the rod. Okay, the rod's bent double over and they're trying to lift the fish out of the water instead of keeping the fish in the water, you know, ready for a release or ready for a gaff shot, whatever it may be. Those two factors alone, okay, are going to make a huge difference in your sail fishing. You know, we talked about all of the tackle, like I said, we talked about the rigging, you know, being ready with all of these little things that all add up to make a very big difference. And if just one, if one of these elements is out of whack, you know, or if your knots aren't good, okay, who cares what tackle you have? Who cares if you have the, the fanciest kites? If you can't tie a knot, what are you doing? Okay, then you're missing the boat. And, and don't think that you need to know all of these super fancy bimini twist, Hawaiian sling, schma, Australian braid, blah, 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 blah. No, learn how to tie an improved clinch knot. Okay, learn how to tie a palomar knot. Learn how to tie a double line or a small loop knot. Learn the basic knots, but make sure you know them well. Make sure you can do it with your eyes closed, with one hand tied behind your back on a rocking boat in the middle of the night in a storm, okay? Even if they're the most basic knots, but make sure that you know them because that's the only thing keeping you connected to that fish. It's something so simple, but yet so important. And you've got to have those fundamentals down pat if you want to work your way all the way up to a consistent kite fisherman, especially for a fish that majestic right there that'll test every little bit of your tackle. Remember, when you're tournament fishing, these guys are reeling as fast as possible or trying to gain that line, trying to release that fish as quickly as possible. When you're drifting and out fun fishing with family and friends, take your time. Isn't it fun watching that sailfish jumping all around the boat, tail walking? Certainly fun for me. I'm screaming like a little girl, okay? You know, it's that exciting. So enjoy every minute of it.